بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه سعيدين بوجودنا بوجود في بلد الحبيب اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد أشكر الجمعية السعودية وأشكر الداعين أشكر الدكتور عبد الرحمن الدكتور فضل الدكتور أحمد أفغاني the local eminent gastroenterologist from Medina Munawar for inviting us thank you all for coming Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim so my topic is uh, was made a little bit easy by the uh, uh, presentation by Dr. Abdelillah so he uh, went quite uh, through quite few of the points that I was going to mention so I will try and keep it as short as possible it's entitled steroid free, free remission is tough, uh, but is a must go. Uh, so we're going to start off with five questions, and we're going to do voting on this, just to get an impression about how our expertise and our local uh, gastroenterologists feel about the magnitude of the problem of overuse of steroids in our community. So I would like, please, if for everybody to really contribute to this. Can we start? All right, so based on your practice, what percentage of patients are on excess steroids or have steroids dependency, based on what you see? is how do you define an excess steroids? Is it more using more steroids for more than 12 weeks? Using steroids for more than six months? Using steroids for more than a year? Using more than one cycle per year? Or using more than two cycles per year? When using steroids during an acute flare, how do you assess response to therapy? Do you assess it based on clinical grounds or based on clinical biochemical or the combination of clinical biochemical and endoscopic? Go, sorry, I, I, I read the wrong uh, question. This is question number three now? Yes. Right. What do you think is the most important reason for excess steroid use in IVD, based again on your experience? Is it self-medication by patients? Is mis mismanagement by primary health care providers? Lack of proper communication between patients and primary health care providers? Lack of IVD de dedicated clinics or all of the above? combination of all, um, although uh, we heard earlier, earlier from Dr. Abdelilah that uh, lack of IBD dedicated clinics is, uh, is an important uh, uh, reason for this, but uh, I think it, we, all of you have seen patients self-medicating themselves. We need, in my opinion, we need meetings like this 
to be given to physicians, to primary health care providers, and perhaps, perhaps we need to go a little more and, and give meetings like this to patients, where the invitees would be patients rather than doctors. We talk a lot among each other, and the patients are relatively uh, not involved actively. Even if we try on our practice to talk to patients, our clinics are very busy, we don't tend to give them the, the, the enough time. Plus, with all these uh, developments in social media, we need to, uh, the, the, the Saudi Gastroenterology Association is doing a lot of effort on this and hopefully this will uh, help us. So we talked about this. The next question is, when using steroids during acute flare, how do you assess response? Clinical, clinical and biochemical, or clinical, biochemical, and endoscopic? I think in my opinion, uh, I go with that. B was the right answer. Now, uh, assessing that endoscopically in the setting of an acute flare uh, not only is perhaps sometimes risky under unexperienced hands, uh, and it is probably with the new studies like Khan and all the others where there's a good correlation between the uh, biochemical markers and response to therapy, perhaps. Unless you are doing a study, then, then that probably is another story. If you decided, if you decided to do an endoscopy to assess the response to steroids, would you do that uh, two weeks after starting steroids, four weeks, eight weeks after stopping steroids, or you don't think it is necessary anyway? Good. So we all seem to be uh, agree on that. But if you decided to do it, perhaps I would choose eight weeks. Now. The definition of an excess steroid, you heard again from Dr. Abdelilah earlier on today, it's an arbitrary definition. But usually if you use steroids for more than 12 weeks, or you use more than one, type, one cycle of steroids per year, then this is considered to be an excess use. We know that it's not good. Steroid, and you've heard that earlier on today, it's not good to maintain remission. Steroids, the way I look at it, is for induction of an acute flare or a new diagnosed patient. And studies have shown this, that even after a year in patients who were, who were maintaining steroids, only one out of per four patients uh, still was still in remission uh, and the other three were in relapse. Uh, also surgery, uh, two out of five patients would end up going to surgery if they were maintaining corticosteroids. So it's good for induction of therapy, but not for maintenance therapy. Now, prolonged steroid use not only is ineffective for maintenance, but is also associated with adverse events. Uh, there's a high risk of uh, serious infections and higher risk of mortality based on the treat, treat registry and other studies, of course. Despite, the interesting thing is that, despite the advances in the therapeutics and the relative, the relative risk of uh, use of steroids, really haven't changed much. Uh, still about 42% of patients of UC are on excess, uh, with moderate to severe UC are on uh, excess steroids and about 28% of patients with Crohn's disease. Now why is that? This study was alluded to by Dr. Abdelilah earlier on. This study was done on an outpatient basis and as he mentioned, not only gastroenterologists but even general practitioners were involved. The message is about 15% of your patients who are using steroids, 15% uh, of all the patients who are using steroids are using it in excess. About 30% have been using it for about a year before enrollment. Of these 15%, 50% of them you can avoid that excess steroids if you are provided with the means of approach, the right approach and the right follow-up. And again, it was mentioned earlier that lack of IBD dedicated clinics as well as multidisciplinary team approach would probably were the two important independent, independent predictors for such an increase in the excess use of steroids. Steroid use also predicts uh, a disabling disease in Crohn's patients. When compared to perianal disease, 
the odds ratio for steroid use as a disabling factor for Crohn's was 3.1% compared to perianal disease, which is so distressing, uh, was reported to be 1.8. Uh, the odds ratio was, was reported to be 1.8. Just two definitions. What is refractory and what is steroid dependent? Uh, what is steroid refractory? Uh, what is a steroid refractory patient and what is a steroid dependent patient? A steroid refractory is a patient who's been on, on a milligram per kilogram dose of prednisolone for about four weeks and hasn't shown uh, a response. Uh, a steroid dependent is a patient who's been on steroids uh, 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 on 10 milligrams per day for, um, was un un unable to reduce the dose uh, beyond 12 weeks, either 10 milligrams or 3 milligrams of beatacinide, or this who have relapsed within three months of stopping the steroids. I think the definition was also mentioned a little bit earlier. Now, how often these, uh, do we see among our patients, patients who are refractory or dependent steroids? For steroid refractory is about 20%. One-fifth of your patients of UC and Crohn's will not respond to steroids. And uh, about 20% of patients of UC become dependent to steroids and much higher in Crohn's, about 50%. Now, why this happens? Uh, Dr. Abdullah alluded to the fact that sometimes we underdose, we don't give the right dose. I see some patients in acute flare and their physicians put them on 15 or 10 milligrams of prednisolone. That doesn't work. You have to give one milligram per kg. Now, most of us use about 40 milligrams per day at least, but not 10 or 15. Other, other physician would start the patient on the right dose, but for a short period, 10 days or two weeks, and then stop. That is also wrong. So underdosing, abrupt tapering, and the genetic factors that were alluded to earlier on by Dr. Shakir uh, and other colleagues. We heard a lot about this. We talked about mucosal healing. You've heard about it all day. This is what we aim for in order to have uh, a better outcome. However, what I would like to uh, uh, stress on is the, that the fact that sustained uh, and durable steroid free remission, free remission is still uh, an important, is, a very, is considered to be one of the very important targets uh, in the management of IBD. You all know about the side effects. Basically early, mostly cosmetic. Late, we start going to complications of bone and, and uh, bone problems as well as uh, myopathy and, and, and so on and so forth. And we see, this is very interesting in our clinics, a lot of patients would come and tell you, oh, I have aches and pains and I want the steroid. In fact, some patients, they go into this when you withdraw steroids and they feel better from their disease, but they say, this thing, the, the withdrawal, what the so-called the, the so pseudo-rheumatism, uh, is so incapacitating in some patients that they restart the treatment in order to get rid of that, mind you. Keep in mind that possibility as well. Just quick view of the data on the steroid remission with the current anti-TNFs. The ACT-1 and uh, the ACT-2 trial on infliximab, steroid-free remission at one year is about 18%. The ULTRA-2, 21%. Of these 21% in the ULTRA-2, when they were followed for a period of four years on ULTRA-3 results, of the 21%, 60% of them remained steroid on steroid-free remission. The uh, PURSUE trial for galimumab, 28% uh, steroid-free remission. And lately, you've heard of the, about the Varicity trial comparing head-to-head -head, uh, adalimumab versus uh, vidalizumab. Now, if we look particularly for that particular thing, which is steroid-free remission, the adalimumab uh, was 21% versus 12% for vidalizumab. But we looked, when we looked at remission as mu and mucosal healing, the vido results were a little bit higher. The COM study, I'm not going to go through. Tight control, you've heard a lot about this. We'll skip that. And the CHARM trial, again on Humira, similar results, about 29% of patients on 
uh, steroid for free remission uh, at 56 weeks. The ADHERI trial is a continuation of the CHARM trial, again similar to what we saw in ULTRA 3. They followed these patients on, on steroid free remission and they found that when we started off with 21% at the end of CHARM, four years later about 28% or in fact most of these patients were still in steroid free remission. So once your patients have gone into remission with steroids, they tend to maintain that steroid free remission. Uh, response longer. So in conclusion, steroids are not effective in maintaining remission in IBD and can lead to a higher morbidities. Steroid-free remission is a well-established target in the treatment of IBD by a lot of societies, or most of the societies. Early initiation of effective therapy and type disease control results in a better long-term outcome. Dependency on excess steroid prescription remains high and have not changed over time. Again, I think probably lack of awareness, maybe self-medication by patients. And there is a need to identify and monitor steroid usage by patients as part of a well-configured and responsive IBD service. And I think our role in this, uh, as well as you heard a lot about IBD nurses and at King Abdulaziz University Hospital, with the MDD team and with the expanding team of our IBD uh, service, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, we are trying to achieve this, but I think there's a long way to go still. Thank you very much. <laughs>